Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're returning to the topic of the Psalms and their meaning. Now, a brief disclaimer before getting into this psalm. The Psalms will be numbered differently in different translations of the Bible. This is a very, very old discrepancy, and to help clear things up, I'll be explaining what number the Psalm has in the Dewey Reims Bible and in the Revised Standard Version. However, the episodes themselves will list psalm numbers as they're given in the Douay Rheims Bible. Sorry if this is confusing. Anyway, this is Psalm 33 in the Douay Rheims Bible, but Psalm 34 in the RSV. For David, when he changed his countenance before Achimelech, who dismissed him, and he went his way. This happened in 1 Kings 21, and it may be context for the psalm, or it may be that this psalm was inspired by this event. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be always in my mouth. We should never speak or imply evil of God. If God could do evil, he wouldn't be God, due to being imperfect in some way. We should also thank and honor him with our words. In the Lord shall my soul be praised. Let the meek hear and rejoice. Phrased a bit oddly, this doesn't mean that people praise the soul of David, but rather that the only thing his soul has any right to boast about is serving God. A soul accustomed to service will be more praiseworthy because it's more like God's. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us extol his name together. Worship is a group activity, not merely an individual one. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all my troubles. When we try to do the will of God, he'll hear our prayers. We may still have to face troubles in the short term, but we'll never be hopeless because God will rescue the faithful in the end. Come ye to him, and be enlightened, and your faces shall not be confounded. The light of the Lord spreads truth to everyone who accepts it, and the people who know and accept the truth of God have nothing to be ashamed of. Remember, it will set us free. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. This poor man, meaning the person writing this psalm, probably David again, We can also say these words about ourselves, however, when God provides us with a means of escaping our own troubles. The angel of the Lord shall encamp round about them that fear him, and shall deliver them. God often sent angels to claim victory for his people in those days, even in military conflicts. This might be a reference to the angel of death being sent to liberate the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. It sounds even more like the angel that wiped out thousands of Assyrian soldiers in 2 Kings 19.35, but it can't be a reference to that since David was dead by the time that happened. O taste, and see that the Lord is sweet. Blessed is the man that hopeth in him. Putting our hope in human beings is setting ourselves up for a disappointment, but God can provide us a hope that goes beyond the abilities of man, and even beyond the grave. Fear the Lord, all ye his saints. For there is no want to them that fear him. No want, in this case, means no shortages. Obviously, people still want things, even if they fear offending God, but because God can supply whatever is needed, the faithful will be given whatever they've wanted, if not in this life, then in eternity, which is even better. The rich have wanted, and have suffered hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not be deprived of any good. We do suffer from deprivations, of course, but only in the short term, God has plans to give rich rewards to those who honestly seek him and try to please him. People who serve only their own riches, however, will find that in the end it doesn't pay. Come, children, hearken to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. We should always be eager to help people understand why they have everything to lose and nothing ultimately to gain by offending God. Who is the man that desireth life, who loveth to see good days? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. If you want to live and like prosperity, don't use your words to do evil or spread deception. That will only make things worse. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek after peace and pursue it. Certainly peace with your fellow man, but most importantly peace with God. Evildoers can come to mutual agreements, but they can never really be at peace because they're not right with God, who's always there with them. Because of this, their souls torment them with guilt and or discomfort for the evil they've done. The eyes of the Lord are upon the just, and his ears unto their prayers. Again, God will hear our prayers more readily when we struggle onward in doing the right thing. But the countenance of the Lord is against them that do evil things, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. 
even the memory of evildoers will one day be removed from the earth. This shouldn't be surprising, since it would have happened anyway if physicists are right about the universal heat death, in which protons and electrons will apparently become so distant from each other that it'll wipe out all clues that intelligent life once existed. Only a miracle can save us from that. When a miracle does save us from that, we might just decide that some things aren't worth remembering. The just cried, and the Lord heard them, and delivered them out of all their troubles. God can and will reward those who act with real justice by rescuing them to a reality where troubles will be a thing of the past. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a contrite heart, and he will save the humble of spirit. A person with a contrite heart is penitent, sorry for having sinned and wishing to do better. They recognize that they're not perfect, and they want to improve, something only a humble person can recognize. God remains close to these people. Many are the afflictions of the just, but out of them all will the Lord deliver them. This one verse sums up the main points of this entire psalm nicely. Yes, it's true that good people suffer horribly, often more than evil people do, but it's only a passing thing for them, because God will rescue them from their suffering one day. The same can't be said for people whose loyalty to God is smaller than their loyalty to their sins. The Lord keepeth all their bones, not one of them shall be broken. We see in this verse a hint of the future resurrection of the body that would later be spoken of in prophecies and overtly spelled out by Daniel and Jesus. This verse may also be part of the reason why the image of the resurrection was centered around the bones so much to the ancient Jews, and why they adopted a practice of placing the bones of the dead in containers called ossuaries. The death of the wicked is very evil, and they that hate the just shall be guilty. When an evil person dies without reforming, it's a terrible tragedy. Their soul has lost out for good, and that's something that can never be repaired. If a person is good and loves justice, no one should have any reason to hate them unless they're trying to get away with evil. We can dislike certain tendencies, even of good people, but we should never hate them. The Lord will redeem the souls of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall offend. Those who trust God will be saved and will no longer be able to sin afterwards because their lives will be so different after that. This psalm is all about the difference between the fates of just people and evil ones. It outlines the way God treats those who remain faithful and the sad consequences of refusing to be humble and turn away from evil. In a way, this is very much an instructional psalm, praising God primarily in terms of his actions in punishing evil and rewarding good. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.